It's time to envision a post-COVID future. As we move forward from response to recovery, what challenges and opportunities lie ahead? How will we move into the future with the knowledge we have gained? How will we continue to learn? How will Windsor Essex reflect, renew, and transform? What comes next depends on how well we understand and respond to the complicated uncertainties of this time. Together, let's explore our collective comeback from this current crisis. The Envision Community Speaker Series is brought to you by the University of Windsor and the City of Windsor. On behalf of the City of Windsor and the University of Windsor, good morning, and thank you for joining us for the launch of Envision, a post-COVID future speaker series. My name is Dr. Cheryl Collier, and I'm the incoming Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences at the University of Windsor, and I'm very happy to be with you today for this first event in the Envision series. We begin this session with an acknowledgement of the land on which we are meeting. Since this seminar is being held virtually, a singular land acknowledgement does not capture the richness of our distribution across many locations in the world. As many of the attendees are located in Windsor, including myself, I would like to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. Attendees are invited to consider their own position with regard to the land where they find themselves. As we make this land acknowledgement, it is also important that we continue to do the work to address systemic and historic injustices that Indigenous peoples have experienced. These pressing responsibilities were made even more clear this week as we learned of the devastating news of the mass burial site at the former Kamloops Residential School. Our thoughts are with the Chikumlet, the Sequipum, and all of the Indigenous communities and families as well as all of those who are mourning this unspeakable tragedy and the intergenerational effects of residential schools. It is important to remember that systemic racism continues to threaten Indigenous peoples and many others, and we all play a part in working towards positive change. Our goal for this virtual series is to bring the community together to discuss what may be ahead for our future in a post-COVID world. Each month, we will feature a nationally renowned expert in a variety of areas, including business, social justice, public policy, technology, and education. Our series speakers will explore how each of these areas have been affected by the pandemic and what we might expect in the future. How will we envision a new tomorrow when the crisis of COVID is behind us? The pandemic has consumed our lives in just about every way imaginable, altering the way we learn, work, socialize, and so much more. We have witnessed many organizations, individuals, teachers, and businesses adopt and innovate in incredible ways. You have been resilient. While the purpose of this series is not to attempt to provide you with all the solutions to tomorrow's challenges, we instead hope to continue important conversations that have already started, ones that will help us imagine a post-COVID future of promise and renewal. After this morning's formal presentation by our accomplished guest speaker, Dr. Irvin Studen, you will have the opportunity to participate in that conversation by asking questions through the Q&A feature chat. We will turn the feature on during Dr. Studen's presentation. However, we will only be addressing questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. Before we welcome today's guest speaker, it is my pleasure to welcome the Mayor of the City of Windsor, Mr. Drew Dilkins. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Collier, and good morning, everyone. On behalf of the City of Windsor, welcome, and thank you for joining us for the launch of this important community speaker series. And I'm very proud to be co-presenting the series as a partnership between the University of Windsor and the City of Windsor. And the lineup of guest speakers is very impressive, and the topics are relevant, and they're timely. And over the next seven months, we'll be talking about the state and future of Canada after the pandemic. We'll be talking about Ontarians on the move, imagining learning and equitable futures post-pandemic. 
COVID as a catalyst to innovation and discovery and much, much more. This series connects back to the key objectives, the priorities and the initiatives and the overall vision of Windsor Works. And that's the city's new economic development strategy that council adopted to diversify and strengthen our economy and to support the city's continued growth. Windsor Works is our roadmap for the future. And the pandemic has certainly presented diverse and complex challenges for communities across the globe. The ever expanding rollout of vaccines is the light at the end of the tunnel and we recognize the need to be ready to build back better, which is the goal at the heart of the Windsor work strategy and we're focusing on a few things location infrastructure future economy and talent and it's known as the lift strategy and the idea here is to leverage our geographical location as an international gateway between canada and the united states and to our neighbor in detroit it's to focus on infrastructure improvements that further build our city up it's to protect existing economic sectors while making strategic investments now to support the future of automobility healthcare education and cross border technologies and of course it's about attracting talent while working with key stakeholders to help them attract and retain the talent they need to succeed this strategy is exciting for windsor and it's exactly the sort of vision that we need for our city and this different this city today is much different than it was 10 or 20 years ago and we need an economic action plan that would work for the next 10 or 20 years. But the city is also different today than it was just before COVID-19, only 16 months ago. So now we need a vision for what comes next as we start to lift our heads up and look beyond the crisis to a future of possibilities. And this speaker series and the partnership between the University of Windsor and the City of Windsor is part of how we get to where we want to be. COVID-19 has changed every aspect of our our daily lives and Dr. Collier mentioned how everyone has stepped up and adapted in unique ways and as mayor of the city of Windsor I can tell you I have been impressed and inspired by the resiliency this community has continued to show and continues to show of course in the face of the pandemic because we're not quite to the end yet. We've come so far together through this pandemic and we have much further to go and my thanks to the University of Windsor president and vice chancellor, vice chancellor rather Dr. Robert Gordon and the entire team working behind the scenes on this series and to each of the guest speakers joining us over the next seven months, beginning with Dr. Studden today. And of course, thanks to each of you for joining us for the conversations that follow. I'm really proud of this partnership that helps us go beyond recovery, moving towards envisioning how to thrive in a post COVID world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Dilkins. And now I would like to invite University of Windsor President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Robert Gordon to say a few words. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Collier. Uh, we are uh, certainly proud to partner with the City of Windsor in providing a platform for thoughtful discussion about what's ahead. There's no doubt we will continue to face many challenges on the road to recovery. However, I want to recognize the incredible innovation and resilience from our students, staff, faculty, and our many, many community partners. We have come together to get through this, although we have physically been separated. Researchers at the University of Windsor are studying the effects of COVID in a myriad of ways that will help inform how we tackle future issues and challenges. Hundreds of instructors threw themselves into the enormous effort to move the majority of our courses and programs online over the past 16 months. Staff from across campus have shifted to supporting students and colleagues virtually, have reimagined services and programs from scratch to meet the demands during these unprecedented times. Our students have also contributed hundreds of thousands of hours of community service throughout the pandemic. It has truly been an exhausting time, but I want to acknowledge that uh, through it all, uh, there has been learning, partnership, innovation, optimism and knowledge creation. There are many lessons we will uh, want to take forward uh, with us into the future. As the number of vaccinations climb, there is certainly hope. Uh, we are hard at work here at the University of Windsor to ensure a gradual and safe return to campus over the coming months. So thank you to the organizing team from the university and the city who have brought this incredible program together. And a special thanks to Dr. Cheryl Collier, our uh, incoming Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Humanities, and social sciences for acting as our host today. Dr. Collier is an expert in Canadian and comparative public policy with a specific focus on how it impacts women and underrepresented groups. And we are grateful that she was able to be here today to help facilitate this important conversation. So thank you so much for joining us today. And I look forward to seeing everyone at the future events in the Envision series. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. 
It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Irvin Student. Dr. Student is currently Editor-in-Chief and Publisher of Global Brief Magazine and President of the Institute for 21st Century Questions. A Rhodes Scholar, he has been called one of the leading international policy thinkers and strategists of his generation. Dr. Student is the Chair Raoul Dandoran on Études Stratégiques en Diplomatique à l'Université du Mont uh, Québec à Montréal and has been a professor of public policy in leading universities and policy schools in North America, Asia, and Europe. His forthcoming book, two books out in 2021 are Canada Must Think for Itself, 10 Theses for Our Country's Survival and Success in the 21st Century, and The Consequences of the Pandemic, What Happened to the World and What's to be Done. Dr. Student worked for a number of years in the Privy Council Office in Ottawa, and in the Australian Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet in Canberra. He was an appointed member of the first ever external advisory board of the Canadian Foreign Service Institute, Canada's Diplomatics Academy. He holds degrees from York University's Schulich School of Business, the London School of Economics, and Oxford University. His PhD is from, from Osgoode Hall Law School, where he was a Trudeau Scholar and winner of the Governor General's Gold Medal. Dr. Student lectures and advises around the world in multiple languages and has written for publications ranging from the Financial Times to Le Monde and the South China Morning Post, to name just a few. His other books include 2014's The Strategic Constitution, Understanding Canadian Power in the World, and 2006, What is a Canadian? 43 Thought-Provoking Responses. The latter formed the basis for the Odessa Prize in Canadiana, which is awarded at several universities across Canada. On top of these accomplishments, Dr. Student was a two-time All-Canadian soccer player. He captained York University's varsity soccer team, played professionally with the Toronto Lynx, and earned two Blues distinctions with the varsity soccer team at Oxford University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Irvin Student. Many thanks, Dean Collier, uh, Mayor Dilkins, and President Gordon, to everyone in Windsor-Essex around Ontario and across the country. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. C'est un grand plaisir d'être des vôtres. Merci de l'invitation. C'est un grand honneur de pouvoir déclencher cette série importante. It's a real pleasure to start this Envision series off for uh, the University of Windsor, the City of Windsor. I really appreciate the logistical energy you've put into it uh, to Joanne and Marianne, so congratulations and, and good luck with it. Um, it's a real pleasure to be also uh, allowed to speak so long on what is obviously the most important uh, concern around the Ben, the future of our great country and the future of the world uh, more generally. I want to start off on a darker note because the reality is dark right now and then end off on an optimistic note so that you don't get depressed uh, or leave depressed, we will leave hopeful and energetic, and that is my aim here. But we must start with uh, bare facts and reality. And I will try to uh, be somewhat original in reframing our understanding of what's happening and where we're going. And most importantly, what can be done? The what can be done part is a challenge to all of us, to our leaders especially, to our young people. We're gonna require a huge amount of work, labor, energy, and dreaming to get out of the hole in which we find ourselves. And we ought not to feel too sorry for ourselves because Canada's had over 150 years of internal peace, largely external peace. We've been untouched territorially by and large by great, great catastrophic public trauma, no wars on the territory for over a century. So our time has come in a sense in comparative terms with other countries. Other countries go through such catastrophes and far greater more regularly and they still come out uh, with a plum, and some don't. So we'll want to be part of the former category. Let me start by saying that my approach is a systems approach. So if we're on Facebook or Twitter, or we're just watching the news, we're doing COVID counts all the time, uh, that's too surface level for what I want to uh, attack here so that I broaden our understanding. A systems approach requires us to imagine that there are many, many moving parts to our huge society. Canada is the second largest country in the world. We actually have a quite a big population. We're a large European-sized country. 
Uh, 38 million, I will towards the end argue uh, that we ought to be much, much bigger. And we're very regionalized, so the territory is huge and our neighbors are very complex. So we cannot just be doing COVID counts for the foreseeable future because we will then beget disintegration on the ground. To understand what's happening, I'm going to argue that we have six, perhaps even seven crises at play in the country, and then I'll argue how we have to get out of them with, with energy. Let me start by saying, by surprising everyone, in, in saying that COVID by now is the minor of our crises, by far. And by the fall, it ought to be a negligible crisis. You know, we have to make that pivot in public policy terms, in administrative terms, in psychological terms. The exit to the pandemic on top of vaccines will be psychological. And when we are ready to pivot out, and many countries have already done so, even at lower levels of vaccination, so that COVID becomes the minor of the six or seven crises. What are the crises? First crisis, public health. Obviously, the pandemic has been affecting us for the last year and a half. About 24,000 deaths, uh, large numbers of illnesses, uh, mental health, uh, delayed surgeries, delayed physical diagnoses, delayed socializing, uh, kinks in the healthcare system, uh, lack of extroversion in the healthcare system such that people don't get the health care they need. They don't imagine that there's a health care system there. It's all been torqued towards the pandemic. We ought to look at it more holistically now. Health care and public health as a large scale crisis with the pandemic by September, the minor slice of that larger public health crisis, which has physical and mental, even spiritual manifestations for the entire uh, body politic of the country. First crisis. Second crisis, and this will be felt in uh, Windsor-Essex and, and all, of, all of Ontario for sure, all of Canada, a huge economic crisis. Uh, huge. We have closed borders. We will have effective unemployment, effective unemployment of over 20% coming out of the pandemic. Tens of thousands of businesses that have disintegrated. Large numbers of people demobilized. Uh, de deconstructed from their workplaces, fiscal fiscal scarcity coming out of the pandemic. The federal government has spent hugely. The provincial governments have spent hugely. We will have limited fiscal resources going forward, especially as international circumstances change, depending, of course, on what happens in the United States, China, and other countries. The economic catastrophe is the second major crisis. Let me talk about the third major crisis in our country, which concerns me most, is the least treated, and I think has the most consequences for our future uh, morally and economically as a country, and that is the education crisis. The education crisis is not just as we imagine everyone having pivoted to online education, as President Gordon rightly said, universities and high schools and elementary schools pivoting to online education as best they can. These are heroic um, logistical efforts. I salute everyone. But what's happened, particularly in, 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 in Ontario and in Canada more generally, is not understood. We imagine that there's a first category, a bucket called classical schooling in university or high school or elementary schooling alike. We're in physical school with walls. The pandemic hits, we all pivot online. The education is by and large impoverished at most levels, compromised, far from ideal, except for certain categories of teaching certain students. I'm for the return to the first category, but we have a third pathological category I called the third bucket. That is no school at all. And in Ontario, colleagues, we have over 100,000 young people, elementary and secondary levels like in the third bucket, no school at all. They were ousted from the physical school, not able to access online schooling at 6% across the province and the country. They were ousted in abusive homes. As soon as they get online, they can't study. Poor homes, homes with illness, homes with uh, requirements for a child to go work. And the work most dangerous category, including in Windsor-Essex, high school students for whom after two or three months, school online loses all spirit, content, meaning, and they defect. These could have been captains of your sports teams, trumpeters, first trumpeters on your in your orchestras, 
school online loses their meaning. They don't have walls. They don't have friendship. They don't have mentorship. They don't have a boyfriend, girlfriend, and they turn the screen off and they're out into the streets or the either or they sit and they disintegrate at home. This is a third bucket that we must reintegrate with the greatest speed because this is our future talent. These are lives and to be direct, these young people will die young without schooling in a post pandemic world that, as I described, will be much more difficult. So we have an obligation by September to get them back in school, find them and reintegrate them. There are 200,000 across Canada, well over 100,000 in Canada. They must be reintegrated into real schooling with spirit, with extracurricular activities, uh, with energy. OK, so these are third bucket kids. I want us to remember that coming out of this out of this talk because it is the most catastrophic uh, of the of the circumstances coming out of the pandemic, even though we don't understand it. I have started a worldwide commission to address this catastrophe. It's called the Worldwide Commission to Educate All Kids. We have over 50 countries represented at top levels on this commission, and it turns out that this problem of third bucket kids ejected out of school during the pandemic is as large as half a billion around the world, including up to 20 million south of the border, including in Michigan and Detroit. So please remember that coming out. We want to pivot to excellence in education and we need to bring everyone along. We cannot have a society of all of our twists in the, one of the most advanced countries in the world where but a year ago these children were in the parks and on the hockey rinks and the basketball courts of the country. The fourth crisis is institutional friends, colleagues, uh, fellow Canadians, Ontarians, the institutional crisis has two heads. First, a collapse in the general information space in Canada, the media space for all our best efforts. We're not able to get good information that represents all of what's happening in the country to decision makers and to the public at large. We're mostly on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, and all those platforms that my, my, my children like for the 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 uh, the benefit of our american colleagues and cousins it is their genius that created the algorithms we use them but the algorithms mean that we are mostly fed information about a different reality we therefore are unable in a country that is very very regionally divided has different linguistic realities different psychological realities unable to paint a common picture of our own realities such that at the height of the pandemic, you'll recall in April of last year during the Halifax massacre, most of the country was not seized of the biggest gun massacre in modern Canadian history. Whereas in the late 1980s, older colleagues will remember that the Ecole Polytechnique massacre in Montréal commanded the public policy agenda for 25 years. The Halifax massacre is not even known by my neighbours in the suburbs of, of Toronto. Uh, well-to-do people educated but are on a foreign information space in the context of a country that is under stress in a pandemic where we need to get our act together across the systems crises this is a catastrophic collapse in in institutions for our decision makers in ottawa and queen's park uh, mayors across the country and of course in quebec city and edmonton in the furthest reaches of of, of the public space they are not able to get the best information on the ground to correct catastrophic mistakes of public policy. And therefore, we have the paradox of being in a democracy where the biggest benefit of a, a democracy that is feedback to power, informational feedback, is absent. The CBC today commands only a tiny slice of the public information space. Most of it is commanded by American social media. Good on them. They're brilliant. Where is our contribution to our painting our own reality so that our decision makers get the best information possible and that we can express our, our own realities to them and amongst ourselves? The second collapse in institutions, part of this fourth crisis, is in Parliament and the legislatures. You'll recognize that most of them are operating in emergency mode, have been for well over a year, and as, as bright as they are, as well-intentioned and professional as they are, they can only do so so long without the corrective feedback of the opposition, of, of other parties collaborating and feeding back that information that I said is absolutely essential that so that they don't make catastrophic errors of public policy. In Ottawa, and, and uh, 
Dr. Collier was, was kind enough to mention, I started my career in the Privy Council office. You'll be surprised to know, and I was shocked to know, that the civil service has been quarantined, essentially uh, demobilized into their homes for over a year and a half, for about a year and a half now. That means that the largest, second largest country in the world is being governed by a civil service, the largest machinery of government in, in the country, that is operating from their home offices and kitchens. They are extremely professional, talented, and hardworking, these, all these people. But they can not be quarantined too long without losing a sense of what's happening on the ground in Windsor, in Toronto, in Edmonton, in Whitehorse. So that machinery must be unfurled, Parliament must play its role, and the institutions must reassert themselves. The fifth major crisis is national unity. The Quebec question has now come back with a vengeance, as I always imagined it would. It is cyclical, it is there not to be fixed, it is there to be managed eternally. It is part of our very interesting reality in Canada, but it is there to stay, and now we must manage it. We must mobilize understanding and language and constitutional experts and public policy to understand that that uh, faucet of our of our national unity uh, picture. But it is only one of three or four major moving parts of national unity. It is the most potentially fatal one because, to be clear, for younger Canadians and Ontarians and 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 Windsorites, if I, if I may, listening, if Quebec should ever go, that's the end of the country. Full stop. We disintegrate. And by the way, I should just start by saying. Uh, as I entered the national unity crisis bit, that Canada is at risk over the next five years, five, ten years. We are at existential risk. We could disintegrate in the next three or four years if we don't get our act together. It could be very fast and it would be quiet. And Canada is too big to understand for any single prime minister or group in Ottawa to be able to reconstitute the second biggest country in the world as it was constituted at Confederation when it was only four colonies. Right, much, much smaller space. So the Quebec question, the second question is the Western question, which is really, really vexed right now and has been really accentuated over the course of the pandemic. If you imagine that Ottawa has been quarantined for a year and a half, the felt distance between the West of the country and the center where we sit, and especially between Ottawa and the West, is that much greater. Ottawa is not only not seeing them, they're not even traveling there. So the feedback mechanisms are poor and the sense of physical isolation and psychological isolation is very, very important in the West. Now, I don't see the West as an existential threat, but we lose the energy, and I'm not talking here about natural reasons, we lose the energy of the West if they're not engaged in confederation. All the talent, and I, I will in, in, in a moment explain why that's the future of the country. And we must re-engage that national unity bit. The third national unity moving part is the indigenous question. We did a land acknowledgement beautifully at the start. The indigenous question is extremely complicated, but it boils down to the following. When confederation was constructed, it was a pas à deux. There were two essential nations, the Anglo-Saxon nation, British colonists and French colonists. The British won the war, the, the Seven Year War. They resuscitated the Francophones into co equals in Confederation, and ever since they've been governing as co equals. The indigenous fact was ostracized to a, a minor part of that pas à deux. The project in the 21st century, if we can execute it, very complicated, is to make it a pas à trois bring the indigenous uh, nations, all of all five, six hundred of them into co-equal status in confederation. Uh, that will be done with the greatest difficulty. It's a moral imperative, it, constitutionally very, very difficult, public policy very, very difficult. We ought not to imagine it as just being a declaration on Twitter or, or Facebook. But if we get it wrong, we risk uh, the, the, the shoot, effectively, the disintegration of the whole. And let us have no illusions that Canada is a permanent project. Countries, on my calculation, have a 60-year shelf life. Before Confederation, Canada was collapsing all the time. And as I said, we've been at 153, uh, 54 years now of confederal uh, peace and continuity. We're well past our due date, so that means we're going to have to work extra hard to keep the internal parts and the extra external parts in, in equilibrium. So the 
And the, the three national unity bits are Quebec, the Western question, and the indigenous question. I will talk about the North in a second. It's not as existential, but it is the future. The final crisis anticipated before the pandemic and felt certainly in Windsor is the international crisis. Uh, colleagues, it is different than what we might imagine. Canada came into the pandemic as a formally vassalized country. I say this not to denigrate, but to, to speak legally. We signed a USMCA treaty in which we effectively vassalized ourselves, requiring permission from the United States for major international decisions and not the reverse. That is a vassalization position understood by all countries around the world. We may well in the end decide that we are a vassal state to the United States and that the United States is the major country of this century, but that bet may be wrong. And to me, it's an underwhelming bet for the second largest country that ought to imagine it thinking for itself. And really, as I would like to, I will argue as we get to the optimistic bit, is one of the major countries of this century, us here in Canada. But the vassalization was accompanied by huge accumulation of en enemy positions internationally, uh, a non-relationship with China, a non-relationship with Russia, and difficult relations around the world such that our enemy to, to ally ratio in demographic terms, you'd be surprised, was two to one. We had two enemies to every strict one ally in demographic terms. Now, here I will surprise everyone if you can see this. So if you imagine this uh, as the map of Canada, as we imagine in the south, a rectangle, the bottom is the border you'll recognize as the American border. But this century, we have three other major borders. We have the European border here, which is an older border. We have the China border here. We have the Russia border. For everyone listening, I would like to, you to also leave with the idea that we have four borders called ACRE, ACRE, America, China, Russia, Europe. Russia is a, a new neighbor by virtue of the melting of the Arctic, which is an objective fact. It's not a, a fact that over which we should cry on Facebook or Twitter. It is an irreversible fact, but Russia becomes our, board, our neighbor to the north. It is huge. We are huge. We meet through the melting of the of the Arctic, and if everyone anyone's been to the to the Arctic, and I'll talk about that in earnest in a second, it's beautiful. China is the major country of this century coming out of the pandemic. It is one of the major consequences of the pandemic. It seals the fact that we start the Asian century today. The Asian century, not as a moral idea, but as an objective fact by virtue of economic strength, psychological strength, administrative power, stability trade links. It just so happens that while it is not felt in Windsor, Essex or Toronto, it is a fact that Whitehorse is closer to Beijing than is Brisbane, Australia. Um, Inuvik Northwest Territories is closer to Shanghai than is Canberra, Australia, where I work. So we are closer to China and East Asia than the Australians are. They are our neighbors. We will have to reckon with them. If you put that ACRE picture together, ACRE, that's 15 combinations of pressure and pull on our territory that we will need to manage. Very interesting geography, potentially very dangerous, but if we succeed, as I will paint and suggest, we will be a major, major country this century. So there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of hope, and a lot of work required. The final crisis, and then I will get to the, I will, I will pivot to optimism, is a social crisis. You will have all felt it in your daily lives, a social crisis, the norms according to which we interact in Windsor, in Toronto, in Quebec. If we can even cross into the Maritimes, anyone from the Maritimes, please let us in. Uh, the north of the country, the west of the country, they have all been shattered. We will have to reconstitute these norms, and I hope they will take a 2019, early 2020 picture. I hope we don't continue in the deep pandemic norms that we've erected through improvisation over the last year and a half. We will have to unfurl and find the better angels of our nature, of our Canadian nature, be kinder, uh, less intrusive in, into one another's uh, affairs, more communitarian in, our, in helping each other, including those third bucket kids, including businesses that have been shattered. But most importantly, for young people and professionals looking at the future, we must, and this is a, a, a really important, uh, as, as, we, as they say in Hebrew, mitzvah, a good deed of this, this 
series, we must begin to dream about the future, because if we don't dream about the future, if we imagine that our life is just pandemic, pandemic counts, then the young people will start to dream, stop to dream. They will emigrate. We will lose them. And some of them are talking about that now. We will lose business people in, in southwestern Ontario. We will not be able to attract as many people. And for regular Canadians, life becomes anomic, to use the sociological terms. It's called anomie. When life loses its meaning, you, you the, the country begins to lose its meaning. Government loses meaning. Laws lose their meaning. And then countries begin to disintegrate without even realizing. We are at that anomic point. We have to reconstitute our, our institutions and rhythms. And I want to pivot to that now. Three rules for pivoting out. And then I will talk about five or six uh, ambitious points for our future in a world, by the way, that is de-stitching, de-globalizing, in which a lot of work needs to be invested to reconstitute the next global era. First, first rule of the post-pandemic world uh, for Canada, thou shalt do no harm. No more ouster of students from education, no more disintegration of business, no more disintegration of institutions, no more borders across provinces where we have today at least four or five strong borders between provinces. One of the national unity bits I, I neglected to mention. We must uh, uh, avoid any additional acts of self-harm because they will be very, very difficult to unwind. And that includes random regulations that make life extremely difficult for business, citizens, people in the healthcare sector. Second, we must reconstitute the daily rhythm of Canadian life. The rhythm of daily life is neglected. It is not a Facebook rhythm. It is not the rhythm of improvised or capricious Twitter. It is the rhythm of school, school reconstituted in earnest, without exception, and universities alike from the fall, happy students day to day. By the way, that's one of the reasons for our general disorientation in Canada. Many people don't know whether it's Monday or Friday, or whether the day is at, ends at noon or one, because we always have lived over the last century plus according to the cadence of the school day and the school year. I used to go to Labor Day soccer tournaments in Windsor, and I knew that by, at the end of that, that, that was the first day of school. Today, students don't know when to get up, when to rise, what homework is. We need to reconstitute that rhythm. The rhythm of parliament, the rhythm of business, the rhythm of cafes, the rhythm of libraries, all of these things need to be reconstituted with due care. This is a very Asian understanding of how a society works. It's a little foreign to us in North America, where we imagine that everything was stable, steady as she goes. We're going to have to work deliberately to do that. So rhythm. And the final point, which has been our, our manifest weakness, colleagues, over the course of the pandemic, mobilization. We must mobilize not on Twitter and Facebook, but in person. Home to home, is everyone OK? Amongst neighbors, uh, government must mobilize in person. Business must mobilize in person. We must reconnect with students in person, teachers, principals, community leaders. We must touch one another again, imminently. And that is important because we have, during the quarantine, had an absence of energy at the center of mutual uh, quarantining, mutual demobilization. We demobilized by law, the state demobilized by law, and in between there was disintegration, whereas the successful countries had mass mobilization. Final point on that, details, details, details. Let us not do it through abstract, bon mot, abstract words. We must get in the details, and this is also very Asian. We must work through the details, the inconsistencies of regulation, inconsistencies of school understandings, inconsistencies are in our communication. And that requires, by the way, for us to meet in person, brainstorm, iterate, correct mistakes. So give me 10 minutes and I will finish with an ambitious uh, agenda that I hope will make you dream. In physics, you'll understand that that there's a path dependency. And it, but if the coordinates of a problem change, you're going to have to work with those according to those changed coordinates. We have been very path dependent in our, in our understanding of the post pandemic world in Canada. And Obviously so, we're extremely inexperienced with such trauma, whereas other societies that have experienced the pandemic have said, no sweat, this is a small thing compared to major civil wars, major world wars, major revolutions, cataclysms. 
And it is, colleagues, a small thing. Uh, it is a, a pandemic. It is not a world historical pandemic. It is not a world historical pandemic in death or illness. It could be, God forbid, and we should imagine that we could be hit with two or three of these things in, simultaneously in the future. That is the future for which we ought to prepare. But we ought to change our coordinates. So we can't imagine that just building a road better post pandemic will get us out of our of our multiple crises. We need to tackle them at the same time, all six or seven crises, but according to a new set of coordinates. First point, let us imagine Canada. We talked about a country of 38 million by the end of the century being a country of 100 million, including in southern Ontario, southwest Ontario, 100 million across the second largest country in the world. This is a debate I've been leading in the country over the last 12 years. It's picked up in earnest. We imagine this population being distributed across our gigantic territory, but increasingly to the north. So I'm for a northern immigration strategy. If anyone has been to Yukon, Northwest Territories or Nunavut, that those three territories combined are as large as the entire European Union. Yukon itself is as big as France. Northwest Territories as big as Ukraine, France and Germany combined, and Nunavut bigger than both of them. The entire population today of that territory, which is opening up through climate change, through melting, and that is my climate change response, opening up to Russia, we have an entire population there of 115,000. 115,000 is, is the size of Ajax, Ontario. So we will need millions more up there. We will need to push our population increasingly north and, re, and, and distribute the population more efficiently uh, through immigration, through population growth and through internal migration, including to the west that I, that I mentioned. So the future will be increasingly north, northwest and along the American border. Second, the entire north of the country should be declared a special economic and environmental zone. For the young people, this will make them dream. This will make many of them move. This will make them invest, but will open up our country alongside of the American uh, market to a, a market of 2 billion people. 2 billion people, that is China and East Asia, that is Russia and the former Soviet space and continental North America. That is six times as large colleagues, fellow Canadians and Ontarians, six times as large as the American market alone and including the American market. And we will have to engineer that. I'm also for, and I floated this during the pandemic, a new Arctic League in which Canada sets the terms for engagement and trade and travel and air travel, including through the North, through those proximities we discuss from Whitehorse, from Yellowknife, from Inuvik to Shanghai for the weekend, to Moscow for the weekend, down to Anchorage, to Chicago, all from the north. This needs to be constructed. It's huge work, but it is a national project that is much more significant and mobilizing than building roads and subways, which we'll need to build as well. Now, to things we understand, third move, build, build, build. Do not build as we build roads. Do not build as we build public buildings. We must build like the Chinese, like the South Koreans, like the Japanese. Working, working, working. It's all hands on deck. High speed rail. Uh, Windsor is, is, is well au fait with this, with this, with this uh, debate. There must be high speed rail across the country and the next generation of high speed travel. And we must build it yesterday. No excuses. We must build it because for every moment we glorify a subway, the Chinese, the Asians, the, the, the Middle Eastern, leading Middle Eastern countries have already unfurled thousands of miles of high speed rail and we're still doing studies. We should have done it yesterday. Now's the moment and it will allow for young Canadians to travel our beautiful country, which is one of the, the great discoveries, I think, psychologically. Fourth major move, languages. This is to the national unity bit, and I'll do my favorite invisible poll amongst everyone listening. How many people are fluently bilingual in English and French? Uh, we will show of hands, show of hands, and I'll say that the, 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 the answer is no more than 18%. 18% is the official proportion of the Canadian population that is fully bilingual, according to recent census. That is catastrophically poor. 
as for a country that is formally bilingual that invests in French education and English second language education, the next generation must be fluently bilingual. English French without blinking. That is a low standard. It's a low standard in Ukraine. It's a low standard in, in Switzerland, a low standard in Germany. English French across the board without exception because we will then need a third language. So I'm for a national language strategy that has English French bilingualism 100% without exception, without sentimentality across the board, plus one more language. Why one more language? Because we have ACRE, we have those wicked borders that could crush us or make us. We're going to need to have huge armies of Mandarin speakers, Korean speakers, Bahasa Indonesia, Russian speakers, Arabic speakers, German speakers, and obviously American English speakers, if I may be so jocular. We're going to need that to, to navigate our circumstances. So the French English across the across our territory for national unity and also that we can we can move across the country without any frictions. You're in Windsor, you can go work in Laval. You're in you're in uh, you're in Bathurst, uh, Nova Scotia. You can go work in Windsor. But also the third language may be indigenous languages. So Ojibwe uh, or uh, Dene. What, what, whatever language, we will resuscitate those languages. And alongside the foreign language, that will be a third major set of, of languages that our population should master. Doubling down implicitly on the education function so that we, when we get back in September, we must reinvest not in education as a zombie theater as we've had it over the last, uh, last year and a half, especially in Ontario, but education with content purpose to prepare our young people in our country for a very difficult but potentially exciting 21st century. Two more points because I'm painting a country that survives the pandemic, invests and because of our circumstances ends up being one of the major major forces of the 21st century for ourselves and for humanity which is really my interest. Information space. There's a big debate about regulating the internet I am for regulating the internet, but not according to our current logic. The first school was to regulate it for privacy purposes. Now we are for regulating uh, Twitter and Facebook and, and, and Instagram and even Netflix for uh, Canadian content or, or for, for adherence to Canadian regulation. I am for Canada becoming a term setting country. Let us create the future algorithms of communication for our own information space. And that is how a term setting country in our circumstances, given our scale behaves. We say thank you very much, Facebook, Twitter. We have our own. We have our own entrepreneurs who will create our own and sell it to the world because we need to tell our own stories on our own terms. So let us not be comfortable just buying a piece of real estate on Netflix. That's American genius. Let us create the future Netflix, the future Instagram, the future Snapchat, what's up and sell it to the world but control our own information space otherwise we will be bombarded by foreign influences and never be able to understand our own circumstances the final point and i'll, I'll close there and i really appreciate the, the 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 forum and opportunity is that we are behind for the first time in my life uh, i realize categorically and i've worked and seen the entire world worked around it we are behind let us not be sentimental or defensive about this. Countries fall behind. Canada started very backward in the 19th century. We became very advanced over the last three decades. We're way behind. We're about 20 years behind now. We must catch up. The only way to catch up on top of the mobilization I talked about is to learn. Let us not be dogmatic. Learn 360 degrees. We must first and foremost learn from countries and traditions and civilizations that are other than us. We will continue to learn from the Americans, but that cannot be our only reference point. We must, as all countries that have been successful in reforming and rebuilding, send delegations around the world in large numbers to learn, to selfishly come back and assimilate those lessons for our own purposes and then help the world, of course. So to China, to Japan, to South Korea, to North Korea, to Russia, to Ukraine, to, to Dubai, to Israel, to Mozambique, we must send our young people um, and our, our professionals and civil service first and foremost, not to Chicago, not to North Carolina, and not to, to Regina, but to all those places that make us less comfortable and often operate in different 
languages, different psychologies, and come back and tell us the lessons that are learned because they have been learning from us for a long time. They've re-engineered and now excelled us. Now it's our turn. Let us be clever, let us be humble, and let us imagine that in surviving the pandemic, in mobilizing and, and, and dreaming again, Canada will be one of the great countries of this century. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Student. Your uh, presentation was so thought provoking. I wrote down so many notes and I'm sure there are uh, quite a number of questions that, uh, that uh, will be coming in. I know there are some already from our audience members and just remind everyone that the Q&A is now open. I'm gonna take the chair's prerogative and ask a first question if I may. Um, and uh, the first question that I have for you, Dr. Student, is uh, is about the uh, the groupings you were talking about at the beginning, the uh, the different buckets of of, uh, of students, uh, and particularly the third bucket that uh, I think uh, you know it's really important for all of us as educators and uh, as parents, uh, etc., to have our our uh, uh, turn our attention to. Um, but I wonder if you could speak about um, some strategies of how to reach that third bucket of, of uh, maybe disengaged students, trying to get them more engaged, bring them on to post-secondary education. Of course, a lot of us uh, listening today are very interested in, in the university, the college sector. Um, and uh, and the, the challenges of, of, of course, as you, will, you, you, you would realize the disproportionate impact that, uh, that marginalized or that the, this pandemic has had on marginalized youth uh, across a number of variety of intersectional uh, disadvantaged uh, uh, areas, um, you know, whether it's indigeneity, we talked, you talked a bit about poverty, um, and, and what we can do as ed educators in the university post-secondary sector to kind of uh, uh, help that, uh, that along. I know that uh, a lot of us are concerned about, uh, you know, onboarding students that are coming from an online education into university, uh, and that's that's one small piece of it. That's not even the people that are that are disengaged. But maybe you have some thoughts on that. Yes, of course. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yes. Sorry about the camera. The the uh, thanks for asking that question. That that um, question has been on my mind and on the minds of the commission that we created over the last six months. I will surprise colleagues and 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 fellow Ontarians and and Canadians by saying that. A good chunk of the third bucket kids are, are neither marginalized nor poor, nor in categories we might imagine uh, would be susceptible such, to such ouster. They are regular kids. So I, the reason I say that is, is so that people understand how this happened, because it took me several months to accept that what I saw at my feet was actually a fact. And it's very difficult to explain in our Canadian mindset what it means for uh, kids en masse to not be in school at all for a prolonged period in one of the most advanced countries in the world. What happened was we went online, everyone was in quarantine, and during quarantine, we imagined because everyone is working according to Twitter words and Facebook words, which have this elegant quality, but they can also have a quality of death whispering. We imagined that everyone pivoted seamlessly to, to, to virtual learning. And what we realized quickly is that a critical mass of the population has no access to online learning at all. Those would be, in many cases, your poorer families, your more rural families, or some that for ideological purposes decided not to. But on top of that, imagine if you're online and you live in a home in which there's an abusive parent or an abusive circumstances or illness, you cannot study, so you're out. Uh, if someone gets ill and you need to tend to that person, you're out. If you're a new immigrant, a child, and you don't have English or French, and your parents don't either, but the language of instruction is English and French, obviously you're out. If you're a high school student, you could have been captain of the of the of the football team in in a Windsor high school, and you went there for mentorship for a girlfriend or a boyfriend. You went there because of the community, because of your identity. You go to online, all you have is a screen. After two or three months you turn it off in huge numbers uh, because school loses its standards, its content, its spirit. You don't have any access to anyone. It goes into this anomic stage. And we've calculated that uh, we're well over 100,000 and growing in Ontario. These are kids who were 
on the fields last year without a problem. Uh, they're out for a host uh, of, of reasons. To get them back, we must do it by September because you can imagine that 13 or 14 year old who is ousted, uh, he, his or her mind will have changed quite a bit over two years uh, of ouster. It's very difficult to return that person to, to schooling. And it is a catastrophic situation to be out of schooling at 13 or 14 and thrust into a post-pandemic world. The world has, if I may be bold, no use for that person. That person will die young. It is painful to say and admit, but that is the catas catastrophe at our feet. And it is a catastrophe that is better understood by our American colleagues, better understood by Latin American colleagues, South Asian colleagues. Intellectually, we have difficulty understanding it. To do it, Cheryl and, and, and colleagues, I will ask for you to start using this third bucket uh, situation and explain that it is a catastrophe. We have a moral obligation to get them back immediately. We must go home to home in many cases. We must uh, double double down on attendance lists and, and, and records from ministries. And it must be understood as a co-equal catastrophe with public health and, and economic catastrophes. Because again, if we go to September and then January with these kids out of school, we will wake up a year or two from now and say, oh my God, what just happened? And who are these people alongside of whom we're living now who have no education, who have been thrust in this world and who are uh, our moral shame, but also a huge destabilizer on, on any capacity to rebuild uh, this country post pandemic. On the other hand, if we do it, uh, we can still catch them. Many of these kids are future professors. They are Nobel Prize winners. And let me just say what one thing that is understood in Windsor, Essex, as it is in all parts of Ontario. One of the great achievements of public education in Ontario is that for the longest time, one can have been from any family, immigrant family, professional family, uh, average family, indigenous, non-indigenous, or criminal family. You send your child to school, you don't even have to ask what that child is learning. He or she will graduate and become a productive citizen and, and even a, 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 an amazing citizen with great achievements. But now we have a collapse. The schools must be reconstituted with spirit and energy without conditions. And on the indigenous side, it is a catastrophe. If you talk with our colleagues in Saskatchewan, Regina and Manitoba, uh, these third bucket kids are even in greater numbers. But again, there's indigenous and non-indigenous and, and the problem is much larger than people can, can imagine. Thank you for that. Uh, I appreciate uh, the, you yeah, taking the time to, to uh, to kind of help us understand that a little bit more. And I know we're energized. I'm sure a lot of us as educators are energized to try and uh, kind of meet that challenge. Um, we have a number of questions. Um, I have uh, three that I'm going to try and combine because I think they're related and hopefully you can uh, kind of address the, the three pieces that are in the in the question, Dr. Student. Um, so I'll start with which country do you think has been leading the way in post-pandemic preparedness and whether or not you think perhaps if there is a country that, uh, and maybe that country that you might think of that's leading the way that could be uh, a successful uh, a country that Canada could emulate moving forward. And then how would you actually measure Canada's preparedness post pandemic? So thinking about that kind of cross country comparison and what we can learn and, and where we're at and when we kind of try to measure ourselves against some of our, uh, uh, our, our colleagues uh, globally. And thanks for that question. I, I will be direct. I, I'm a Canadian patriot. I'm uh, very hard on our country, but only out of out of ambition for our country and love of country. Our performance in the pandemic as a collective has been um, pathetic. And I say this in comparative terms and comparative terms uh, um, historically. And it's perhaps not a surprise because we've not had, we've not been tested uh, in such, with such ferocity. And our public class is untested. And I worked alongside, they're all professionals. And I worked in national security. I was one of the writers of the national security policy in 2004 where pandemic preparedness was on paper and we iterated plans. The problem was that we did not feel the preparedness. We wrote it, we intellectualize it, but we didn't have a felt preparedness that even societies that were less advanced, less educated, less sophisticated had. So we have 
not done well. Fortunately, it has not collapsed the country, but it cannot happen again because the next time will be the collapse. So we must, we have learned our lesson and, and countries go through these periods where they learn a lesson. Uh, if I go back to the Australian example, I worked in the Australian Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet and studied their history and system. And they, by the way, have come out much, much better than us. And I'm not surprised because they have a more serious public class that had their reckoning in the Second World War. In the Second World War, the Australian public class was colonial, virginal, uh, naive, and they were bombarded by the Japanese just as they imagined that the British would protect them. And they said, never again can that happen. The British will not protect us again. We know that. We have a felt appreciation of that. And therefore, we will think for ourselves, we will be serious. And the Australian political public class, the intellectual class, is less educated than ours, less sophisticated, but more serious in terms of results. And so I'm not surprised that all they did better, New Zealand did better. We have an amazing public class in education. Now we must come out of this, not with bon mot, we must have a felt appreciation of what it means to die. To die, not just from the pandemic, but die through the collapse of public institutions. So we must protect them at all stages. The countries that have done well, are ones that provided the energy at the front end or at the back end. And we're still waiting for our energy push. The energy at the front end were the East Asian countries, China, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Vietnam, where there was mass mobilization early on to reckon with the pandemic and all this other systems crises that I mentioned, including education, where they did not have this third bucket crisis. They look at us like we're from Mars. Or Australia, where they close the borders very fast. They have a deep quarantine culture. If anyone's been to Australia, they're an island. They have a very uh, serious political class across the parties. New Zealand, the same. Countries that were stronger on the back end were Israel, which started in total chaos, but to no surprise for me, uh, was able to mobilize through a, a military machinery and a logistical machinery and a sense of national unity, mobilize uh, incredibly to vaccinate and then they're out they vaccinate to be out the israelis have forgot about the pandemic they've already been they've already been they've already had a war they, they're ready for the second or third war after that they're out the british the british started in political chaos brexit they mobilized through uh great great energy they're essentially out and by the way they mobilized with with remnants of a term setting country they created one of the vaccines we neither had the vaccine creation nor the, the, the mobilization. Our American brethren started in ridiculous chaos, but mobilized with American uh, moxie and zest. Uh, on the third bucket crisis, our American colleagues are formidable. Their crisis is far larger, but their daring, their energy, their sense of public community and, and obligation, their leaders are bringing energy. And we're, so we have to bring that energy and the energy and the, the extroversion, as I call it, is, is the most important part. Let us not quarantine again on the public side. When public quarantines, the public must be tended to across the systems. The public class must mobilize, must provide the requisite energy across education, uh, economics, healthcare, and, and, and so on. So those are the lessons. I think we're gonna, coming out of this, say never again, but not just a pandemic, because the next crisis won't be a pandemic. The next crisis will be a cyber crisis, it'll be a war, it'll be a civil crisis, it'll be a, a legal crisis, it could be an American crisis. We need to have an all hazards approach, but with a serious political class that means business existentially, right? And then practices, and then practices. And we need to prepare young people for that, because perhaps that's just the regular order of business in, in a country as complex as ours. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is on the language challenges that you uh, spoke so eloquently about uh, for Canada. And uh, that question is, how would you operationalize a bilingual strategy for Canada? That's great. Thank you. Merci de cette question. Uh, I went to French immersion. And then I polished my French in, in Europe and I, I worked in Ottawa. And, and as a result, I have deep insight in, into Quebec and, and other, other countries. But now I look back and I say, let's take French immersion. I'm sure there are a number of French immersion grads at the uh, listening across the country and their parents whose kids are in French immersion. There might even be French immersion teachers. 
in our system, one of the things that happens with my own kids coming out of grade eight in French immersion is that everyone defects after grade eight. You have a, a 70 to 80 percent defection rate so that the French completely disappears and they go on to English uh, education. Good on them, but they lose the French. Everyone then goes in again, sets their kids into French immersion for a variety of reasons and the cycle continues. There's no amelioration. We end up with 18 percent which is a very, very low number because that's the category. We, we pick our prime ministers from the 18%, our Supreme Court justices, our deputy ministers, many of our premiers, our public intellectuals, heads of Crown Corp. That's a very small talent pool and it's only a linguistic talent pool, right? What about all the other things that commend uh, a person to, to positions of leadership apart from? So language should be generalized. How do we do that? Well, French immersion should be the norm, but it shouldn't be exotic at all. It should just be a French English by, by education across the country and I assure you that after five years of painful uh, debate there will be no debate it will become part of the furniture and it will be expected of course you speak English and French in Ukraine uh, and and Russia these are countries I study a lot I have many many uh, colleagues there and I and and, and I, I, I observe the linguistic situation Ukraine is an interesting country because they speak English uh, Russian and 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 Ukrainian uh, simultaneously on any show to one another without blinking and all of them speak English as well in a country that is on its knees economically and strategically they have all the linguistic gifts for which we're struggling so French as French immersion across the board but not exoticized so a French English by education let that be the norm and on the demand side we need to create CBC the new new print me media new social media new online media new institutions that operate fluently and and fluidly in both languages without blinking. So it's it's it is a process of engineering, but it is necessary for the unity of the country. And the third language then means uh, we just create critical mass of people who study a third language and you'll say, well, there are immigrants who speak all these languages. And I say, well, yes, but we must professionalize the use of all those those immigrants and the young people must also master a, a third tongue. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question uh, is uh, is on uh, kind of purpose of uh, and and kind of I guess the the uh, challenge of convincing Canadians to to kind of follow this uh, this lead here. So uh, as a questioner writes, thank you, Dr. Student, for an inspirational analysis of challenges and forward positions. My question is this: Why should Canada take those forward positions? In other words, what will happen if we don't? Well, the dark scenario is disintegration, and I'm going to be very direct. We don't imagine it. But we didn't imagine a pandemic in which we'd have 200,000 third bucket kids who were in school, or we didn't imagine we'd have 20% unemployment and not blink. Or we didn't imagine that we'd all be sitting at home, uh, in many cases worried about health, in many cases isolated from family. So things happen. And for the last 10 years, I have said countries have a shelf life. So too with Canada and everyone outside of Canada understands that because they understand their own reality. The shelf life is 60 years, okay? Uh, the Soviet Union lasted 69 years. It was imagined that that country would be interminable, indefinite. Um, France has gone through five republics. Ukraine until its recent revolution lasted 23 years and, and so on. Singapore is about 50 years old. It won't last the entire century. China has gone through, China is a name, it is a civilization, but the modern country of China is younger than, than Canada. So Canada too can disintegrate. Now, I wouldn't wish that on anyone because disintegration is the end of a, of a lifetime. All of us who will have had credentials in Canada, education, identity, and mentality, we lose everything. Who are we at that point? Okay, so, and disintegration also means mass death. It means economic destruction annexation all of these things can happen and disintegration would happen very fast if we want to not disintegrate we must fight for our lives fight for our lives means not tweeting and facebooking it means work and again i don't want to be sentimental it means national work it means a national sense of mission where is our fighting force in canada people who are ready on the public side especially to fight for the future of a country that uh, would have taken a millennium to, to build in any other in any other era. This is how big Canada is. It, it takes them. Canada is bigger if you look at it and you can do the math. 
bigger than the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire combined in territory. That's how big it is, and it's a peaceful, prosperous, civilized place. So obviously we'll need to fight for it. So the conviction is that we must make Canadians dream. We must make it exciting again. And it is a leadership push. It is not one by one, I will convince you. And when we reach a consensus, then we will do something. It is really a leadership push in existential uh, terms. And then for the young people, I think they will get it right away because it gives them an object for which to dream. Well, an object to which to dream is, is a great note uh, to, to finish off. Unfortunately, time has now run out for questions. I know we probably could talk uh, much, much longer, uh, but you've certainly given us uh, a lot to think about. Um, and uh, and uh, for that, we are very thankful. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning to envision a post-COVID future. I, th I think this was been a, this has been a great start to get us uh, our creative juices uh, flowing and to get us uh, thinking about what we can all do to be part of that uh, that post-COVID future in a positive way. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. Studen. Uh, thank you for your time and for sharing your your thoughts uh, and uh, uh, your uh, your vision for uh, where we can go and. Uh, I know we're all hopeful that uh, that a lot uh, that the governments and and leaders and 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 all of us will be able to take up some of that challenge. Um, for you. everyone who oh well, thank you, um, for everyone who has attended this morning, uh, your name has been entered into a draw to win a $200 prize package uh, of University of Windsor and City of Windsor branded items. Uh, we will be contacting the winner uh, of that prize package directly via email at a later time. And I wanted uh, to stand by thanking again everyone uh, for attending today's event and to remind you that this is the first of our series. We have some incredible speakers still to come each month in 2021, and we encourage you to join us again. Please RSVP at uwindsor.ca backslash envision dash series at your earliest convenience. Thank you and have a great rest of the day.